stressing divas and their impact on LGBTQ rights. Please welcome Trevor. Thank you. Go to any gay club in the world on a Saturday night and you will undoubtedly see a drag queen lip syncing to a song by a gay icon such as Cher, Madonna, or Lady Gaga. While some might think that this prevalence of cross-dressing in Western society is a modern phenomenon, cross-dressing was common in the Baroque and classical Italian opera, where men were castrated before puberty and performed female roles in musical performances. There are a number of cultural differences between the methods and reasons for these gendered performances, ranging from the public's desire to watch these gender-bending acts the performers themselves wanting to try on a new gender. It is interesting to look at these different, different instances of cross-dressing in musical performances because cross-dressing has been frowned on for so much of history, yet has also been accepted in certain circumstances. While these circumstances have varied greatly, there are some correlations, particularly the use of cross-dressing as a means of entertainment. Since the dawn of church music with Byzantine and Eastern European ceremonies, castrati had existed. Composers were writing music for high voices, yet females were not allowed to sing in Christian churches due to the patriarchal nature of the religion. At this point in history, it was mostly monks that were being castrated to, to obtain these high voices needed to sing the parts. Even with the ban on female vocalists in Rome, the fascination with the female voice spread throughout Italy up to Florence, where the Concerto de Donna was formed to perform secret music for, for the court of Ferrara. As the popularity of the soprano voice grew, the need for high voices did in church choirs as well. While Pope Clement VIII took a stand against castration, he said it was authorized for the glory of God. As, com as church composers started to understand the possibility of using castrati voices, secular composers started to use the castrati in a number of ways, particularly to play female roles if female singers were not available or allowed. A number of operas used several cross-dressing parts, with one prime example being Alessandro Scarlatti's Pompeo. There was, this is a great work to study due to the diversity of character portrayals done by singers of opposite sexes. The opera has very few roles being played by the sex of the character. Men are playing women, women are playing men, and castrati were being used for both female and male roles. Women playing the role of a man was known as travesti. While there are many instances of this phenomenon, it was most common to, for a woman to play a castrato role when a castrato was not present so that we could still have that high voice. Um, the reason for all of these character shifts was that composers were experimenting with um, combining, combining a lot of different vocal timbres to find the blend that they found most aesthetically pleasing. In some ways, this was a more free and open time for composers as they were not locked into vocal stereotypes of the heroic tenor and the soprano heroine. By the late 19th century, these standards were so ingrained that cross-dressing had almost stopped, minus historic performance, comedy, and females acting as young boys. Um, one of the most interesting things about the castrati phenomenon is that in most cases, the castrati did not choose to become one. The decision was made by their parents or another musician before the child was able to comprehend what was actually happening to them. This is an interesting departure from many other in instances of cross-dressing throughout history, as the actual person doing the gender switching has little control over their gender roles. Um, they were becoming the opposite gender because they wanted to um, they were not becoming the opposite gender because they wanted to, but instead because someone else made the decision that it was something they should do. In the mid-19th century, the popularity of the castrati voice declined due to the rise of the tenor as the hero of Italian opera. The opera reform instituted by Gluck in the mid to late 1700s also played a large role in the end of the castrato. Many castrati would rely on added embellishments to draw in and maintain an audience. As composers started to limit the performer's ability to do so, they also limited the power of the castrati. To this day, there remains only one recording of an actual castrati singing, though it does not do justice to the apparent crystalline quality of the castrati voice. Perhaps the most infamous castrati of all time, though, is Carlo Maria Michelangelo Nicola Rossi, more commonly known by his stage name, Farinelli. Born in 1705, Rossi moved to Naples when he was young and began to study with the pedagogue Nicola Popora. He made his public debut in the 1720 performance of Popora's opera Angelica e Medro. While Farinelli would be remembered simply for his career as a performer, his impact on all of music is just as extensive. He was an active composer as well as keyboardist and violist. Above all, his vocal, silencing, vocal stylings and musicianship made him an artist that everyone strived to be like. A true Renaissance man of music, Farinelli is a musician that is far too often forgotten. As Castrati left the stage, another group of cross-dressing performers entered, 
drag queens, and drag kings. Male and female impersonation has existed for centuries, as previously discussed with Castrati and Travesti. In the mid-19th century and early 20th centuries, a number of high-profile male homosexuals and lesbians were known to dress as the opposite sex as a way of helping bring issues of homosexual rights to the forefront of society. During the jazz age, a number of African-American female jazz singers would dress as men in their acts. Gladys Bentley, seen here, would regularly wear tuxedos in her performances, and there are a number of drawings of the infamous Ma Rainey dressed in full drag trying to seduce women. In the 1960s, drag queen pageants began all around the United States and became a stigma of the homosexual community. However, after the Stonewall Riots of 1969, drag queens took center stage in the gay rights movement as they were already out and proud. Different regional styles of drag began to develop across the country through drag shows, balls, and pageants, creating subcultures within the drag community. Many comedic writers know that having a man dress up as a woman is a very easy way to get cheap laughs. But as a culture, we should remember that people dress in drag for a number of different reasons. There is an assumed link between drag and homosexuality, though one does not have to be gay to perform in drag. A number of people become interested in drag, though, because of feelings of transsexualism and believe that it is a good way to test run another body. Others feel that drag is a way of performing gender to an extreme. Judith Butler, the famous um, um, feminist theory writer, says that drag is subversive to the extent that it reflects the imitative structure by which homogenic gender is itself produced and disputes heterosexuality's claim on naturalness and originality. Butler is saying that the act of dressing in drag is meant to point out the inconsistencies in the traditional view, view of the duality of gender and the fact that we as humans consistently try to fit everyone into our established dual gender roles. Then there are those who try to break the mold and they are ostracized from society for their nonconformity. In terms of drag and music, there are two main instances, the performers who always dress in drag, and then those who um, cross-dress from time to time to make a cultural statement. Drag queens and kings make up a subculture of the gay community. Um, while this community has existed for many decades, it started to come to the forefront of pop culture in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The 1990 documentary film, Paris is Burning, helped enlighten the American public about what was happening in large cities around the nation. This film highlighted many parallels between drag culture and classical musical training of castrati. In the late 18th and 19th century, most castrati attended specialized conservatories with programs specifically for developing their voices. At these schools, developing singers learned from great talents about how to increase their skills so that they could become opera stars as well. A parallel in the drag world is the presence of drag houses or drag families. These are groups of drag queens who are all mentored by an older, more seasoned drag queen. These drag mothers help their protégés learn about the technical aspects of drag, including sewing, makeup, and lip syncing, um, similar to how the vocal teachers in conservatories taught young castrati. Most drag queens also go through a process known as tucking whenever they begin the process of getting into their drag personas. This process involves manipulating the male genitalia so that it appears more like the exterior of a female's body. Um, while this is not a permanent procedure, like the orchiotomies that Castrati went through to obtain their unique voices, drag queens do go to extreme lengths so that they both give a more accurate performance as well as feel more feminine. One of the icons of early drag is RuPaul. Having moved to New York City in the early 1980s, she lived among the homeless drag community of Central Park um, eventually rising to stardom with the release of her hit single and music video, Supermodel of the World. Not only was this the first portrayal of a drag queen in a positive spotlight, it also started the um, trend of the creation of drag scenes throughout major cities around the globe, as well as an increase in numbers domestically. One drag queen is even, just quoted, or is even quoted as saying, the day RuPaul came out, the number of drag queens went from 20 to 1,000, because every faggot thought, I can be a star too. It was really crazy. I hated her for that. Now I'll show you a nice clip of the music video.
This is actually the first music video by a drag queen to be performed on MTV. One can interpret this video in a number of ways. She could be singing and dancing this way as a means of shocking the audience, as at this time many people in small towns had not seen a drag queen. She could have been doing this as a way of being arrogant and trying to prove to the world that she is truly the most beautiful woman. Not that anyone would ever dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> she could also have been trying to help demonstrate to the audience that there are many different interpretations of beauty and that all should be valued and accepted. Finally, she could also be seen as helping those who are confused with their gender to realize that they can be whoever they want and will always be beautiful. While the lyrics and the attitude present in this video can make um, some of these seem like a stretch, I do believe that her message is of acceptance. Since Supermodel of the World premiered, there has been an explosion of cross-dressing in popular culture, even to the point that there is a number one reality TV show to help find future drag superstars. In contrast to those performers who only perform in drag, there are those who simply take on a same-sex persona from time to time to make a point. There are examples of performers like this throughout a number of musical <coughs> genres, with perhaps the greatest numbers being in pop and rock. So, um, stars such as Freddie Mercury, Boy George, David Bowie, and Lady Gaga have all been known to dress as a different gender for shock value or performance reasons. In a recent Lady Gaga music video, You and I, Gaga takes on a number of personas, including male, female, and mermaid. Perhaps one of the most provocative scenes has Gaga portraying both a male and female role. The male persona is known as Joe Calderon, see here, um, a typical hyper-masculine male. Calderon made his first appearance on the cover of the September 2010 issue of Japanese Men's Vogue. Since then, the pop music scene has been abuzz with discussion about who exactly Calderon is and what his relationship is with Lady Gaga. In the video, Calderon comes complete with cigarettes and actions that some could almost interpret as domestic violence. In contrast, her female persona is extremely feminine with neutral makeup and white clothing, leaving us with a feeling of innocence. Some could say that Gaga is doing this for shock value. I would argue instead, though, that she is having the audience think critically about the duality of gender. And I'll show you a clip of that as well. <laughs> That's Calderon with the other persona of Lady Gaga right there and her new twin there does. While the obvious interpretation is that Gaga cannot live without her lover, um, I can see another meaning to this detail. Gaga is saying that she herself cannot live without her masculine and feminine traits, and that others should not either. It is interesting to note that Lady Gaga is a self-identified bisexual, having had both male and female sexual partners in the past. A number of her songs deal with her bisexuality, including her early hit Poker Face, which many interpret to be about a woman who sleeps with a man but wishes it was a woman. One could also say that Gaga is trying to make her audience challenge their views on gender, sexuality, and desire. Heather Humon brings to forth brings forth a situation in which a heterosexual male who is sexually attracted to Lady Gaga realizes that Gaga is called her own and that they're the same individual. Does this mean that the man is having homosexual attraction since he is now attracted to a man? Is a heterosexual female who is attracted to Joe Calderon having lesbian feelings because Calderon is actually a female? Lady Gaga is using her music and music videos to express her feelings of attraction to both genders and in a way, her feelings of identifying with both genders. Within each of us, there are masculine and feminine traits. It is important that we do not ignore either side or aspect of our personality, as this could lead to sexism developing within our society. There are countless other examples of cross-dressing throughout musical history, and they all serve a purpose. Whether to fill the role of a missing gender, or to question and defy conventional gender stereotypes. The acceptance of cross-dressing in music um, the acceptance of cross-dressing in music um, without coming across as comedic is key. It shows that those in the music community are more concerned about the integrity of the art than those who are creating it. 
To some performers, cross-dressing is who they are. So for the community at large to make a mockery of it is simply cruel. Humanity has come a long way in our acceptance of alternative lifestyles, though there is still much work that needs to be done. In the eternal words of RuPaul, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? And I'm going to amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Sure, this is not really about music, but I mean, going back even into like Hollywood person like mm -hmm. Milton Berle and Jackie Gleason, and even mm -hmm. more modern like Little Richard and Mary Tyler yeah, Moore, definitely. I mean, they all went to sort of like cross dressing for mm -hmm. comedic purposes, yes. and yet they seem to be much more widely accepted than the so called, you know, male dressing mm -hmm. up as a woman, which has really taken a long time for us to be recognized as who we are. Yes. Um, I really believe that cross dressing up until recently has only been accepted as a means of cultural entertainment. If it's seen as truly who the individual is, then it's not widely accepted. But if they are doing it, even if it is true they are, if they are entertaining enough, then society will accept it as simply comedic, something that they value for humor more than their actual being. Yes? Do you think that there's value in that? In people becoming more comfortable with it as comedy, and do you think that that allows for them to become more comfortable, or do you think that it's a bad thing? Um, I feel like it's stepping stones. Okay. Um, back in the early 1900s, when um, homosexuality itself was not even widely accepted, I feel like if we can make stepping stones with comedy, um, and then eventually leading to where we are today, gay rights movement, Hopefully gay marriage will be passed very soon. Um, it's come a long way, and I feel like now only accepting it as comedy is not necessarily the best thing, yeah. but um, I mean, with Gaga, she's number one artist, and she's cross-dressed on a number of occasions, and so I feel like we're moving past that now, which is good. Any other questions? When, yes. you, when you started this research, <laughs> um, did it take you in a different direction than you expected? Was it just sort of supporting ideas that you were already... Um, this paper started as a paper I had to write for my music and gender class. Um, and we the paper was basically to find... Um, it was about imagery in music and gender. And so it started um, more focusing on... Um, it started Castrati versus Drag. And it kind of came out of the movie version of Farinelli. Um, and when I really started it, I had to, it was kind of a shock that um, Castrati didn't always cross-dress since they did also sing male roles with their feminine, vo feminine voices. Um, so the Castrati aspect has become a lot more downplayed than it originally was. Um, but gender, especially dragon music, has, is definitely one of my major research interests, which I plan on pursuing in the any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.